Imagine this. You're me, but 11 years old. It's Christmas 2012, and even though you're late to the party, you finally saved up enough money to buy a Nintendo Wii a few months prior. The only game you have for it is the new Super Mario Bros. game that came pre-bundled with your Wii, and you can't wait to get some more Wii games for Christmas. It's finally time to open presents, and you get just what you asked for. Various Wii games. But most of the games are shovelware titles found in the bargain bin section. There are a few noteworthy titles from the series you love, mostly Kirby's Epic Yarn and Kirby's Return to Dreamland. Then there was also one mysterious little Wii game from a series you've hardly heard of before, Animal Crossing. You open the gift and see Animal Crossing City Folk for the Wii. You've vaguely heard of it before. You're familiar that there is a game for the DS, but nothing much else. You don't even know what genre of game it was. Little do you know that this game would forever change your life. Flash forward eight years later, and here I am making a YouTube video about Animal Crossing City Folk, the very first Animal Crossing game I've ever played in my introduction to the series. In my many years on the internet, it's shocked me in recent years to see that City Folk is not as loved as I thought it was, but instead the butt of many Animal Crossing jokes not even well respected and not even played by a large portion of the Animal Crossing community. It's currently the worst-selling mainline Animal Crossing to date. I said mainline. This criticism is not new either. The game was disliked even from the moment it was released, causing the Animal Crossing dev team to step back and recreate the Animal Crossing formula with New Leaf. While part of the purpose of this video is to ask why this game flopped as hard as it did, this video also serves another purpose. To praise City Folk when it seems like hardly anyone else will. Part 1. Talking about a game that this video isn't even about. Animal Crossing Wild World, released for the Nintendo DS and the US in 2005. Yes, I know what the title of the video is called. The success of Animal Crossing Wild World was quite unprecedented and quite surprising. It ended up outselling population growing for the GameCube, and while that's understandable, the DS as a console outsold the GameCube tremendously, this was in the early days of the DS before people knew just how successful the system would be. Not to mention that Wild World outsold population growing by a landslide, eventually outselling it by 10 million units. Think of it this way, population growing sold a little over 2 million units worldwide. Meanwhile, Wild World sold almost 12 million units worldwide. Yeah, that's a lot. Wild World is the ninth best-selling DS game of all time, right behind Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and right above Super Mario 64 DS, a launch title for the DS and a remake of arguably one of the most infamous games of all time. Wild World was only the second title in this rather young series and already established a place by giants like Mario and Pokemon. The actual contents of Wild World was actually quite similar to Population Growing, and didn't change much of the Animal Crossing formula. If you look at the early concept trailers for Wild World, in fact, they looked almost identical to Population Growing. While eventually developing a style of its own, Wild World was kind of marketed to be more Population Growing, but this time, you can play it on the go. And this was a great feature of Wild World, the first time to play Animal Crossing on the go. Just like in Population Growing, you arrive to a new town full of animals. You have a part-time job, and then you're free to catch fish, bugs, plant trees, buy items, and of course, pay off your home loan and forever be in debt to Tom Nook. While it mostly stayed the same, Wild World did add some new things that are staples in the series today, however. Areas such as the roofs, the observatory, Shampoodle, and the town hall were added in this installment. It's crazy to think that it wasn't until Wild World that the town hall appeared in Animal Crossing. I oftentimes forget it wasn't in population growing because of how important the town hall is to the games. Wild World also added new special characters like Dr. Shrunk, Brewster, Harriet, Celeste, Lyle, Pascal, and Katie. The slingshot and watering can were also new tools introduced in Wild World. And one of the biggest selling points of Wild World was the fact that it was the very first Animal Crossing game to support Wi-Fi connection, meaning that for the first time ever, you could visit other players' towns and play with them in real time. This was a tremendous leap for the series, and I don't think the series would be as popular today if it were not for the ability to connect and play with others. While I'm currently giving Wild World a lot of praise right now, there were some downsides to the game that I think could have been improved upon in the next installment. While Wild World did add 18 new villagers, they completely removed 188 villagers. They also added new holidays and events such as Law D-Day, Yay Day, the flea market, and the bug off. 
But this was because they completely removed major holidays from Animal Crossing. Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, Halloween, gone. It's crazy to think that in this game, there is no way to celebrate your favorite holidays, another iconic staple to the series. The removal of holidays was due to the localization process being difficult and lengthy, with thousands of lines of text to read and change. So they removed all holidays introduced in population growing and created general holidays for every country. In addition, you also had to share a house with other people who shared the game with you. This was unlike population growing, where everyone who shared the game at least had their own house. This kind of sucked, since at this point in time, your house was really the only thing you could customize. If you had siblings or someone you had to share the game with, the one thing you could personalize and make your own you had to share. The towns were also naturally smaller due to being on a cartridge and having to fit on the DS. Also, I do understand that this game is from 2005 and on the Nintendo DS. The game honestly did not look the best, and it left people wanting a new Animal Crossing game with better graphics. What if the next game were to have the new features brought from Wild World, but were in the best graphics we've seen yet? Even better than that of population growing, this left a lot of room for a follow-up. Part 2, A Game of Many Names With how tremendously popular this game quickly became, it was no surprise that right after the Wii launched worldwide in late 2006, the Animal Crossing dev team had started working on a new Animal Crossing game for the latest Nintendo home console. This new Animal Crossing game would utilize a new feature exclusive to the Wii called Wii Connect 24, a feature where the Wii would be able to download and receive updates, messages, memes, and game content even if the Wii was turned off. This seems like a standard in today's world, but it's quite impressive that the Wii could do this so early on, especially considering that it was the first Nintendo console to use Wi-Fi. So this was on the forefront of everyone's minds during development, setting up the fact that this new Animal Crossing would use the internet even more than Wild World did. The localization process proved to be especially hard, for the same reason Wild World was so hard to localize. But Holidays would return in this installment, which was super exciting. The game was eventually announced to be named Animal Crossing City Folk in the US, but it had other names elsewhere, being named Animal Forest Let's Go to Town in Japan, and Animal Crossing Let's Go to the City in Europe. The game seemed really promising, and fans were excited to see Animal Crossing return to the big screen in modern day graphics, as well as visit a big new area introduced in this game, the city. No longer were fans living in a small town in a secluded forest, but were now in the big city with all new things to do and discover. City Folk had a holiday launch of November 2008, and was expected to sell just as well, perhaps even more, than Wild World did. With a holiday launch tailing off Wild World's global success and on Nintendo's best-selling home console at this point, what could go wrong? Oh, oh my goodness. Well, what happened? Part 3. Before we talk about what City Folk did do right, what went wrong? Well, while critics didn't call this a bad game per se, it definitely had its criticisms. Or, I guess, one criticism. The main and really only criticism of this game was that it was too similar to past installments, that being population growing in Wild World. Fans and critics alike just viewed City Folk as an upscaled, glamorized Wild World port. I mean, the two games even share the same soundtrack. That's not a diss, I mean hot take, but the Wild World and City Folk soundtrack is probably my favorite in the whole series. But oh my goodness, the fact that they share the same soundtrack certainly didn't help to convince the critics that they weren't basically the same game. They also featured the same concept yet again, moving into a town of strange animals and just doing various activities as the day goes by. Many people don't talk about this, but Wild World also received quite some criticism too, actually, despite how well it performed. It did not receive as much criticism as City Folk, but Wild World was also criticized for the same reason City Folk was in the beginning. The fact that it didn't change much at all from the original Animal Crossing formula was just kind of a downscaled population growing port. But these criticisms were not as vocal and were mostly overshadowed by the fact that this was the first portable Animal Crossing game and the first game in the series to utilize Wi-Fi connection, which critics felt like made up for this problem. But it seemed as if people felt like City Folk didn't bring many new things to the table. And after all, this was the third time seeing the same things repackaged. Technically more than third time if we count all the re-releases of population growing in Japan. As for why it didn't sell very well, I think this can be attributed to three different reasons. The first reason being the reason I listed before. It was likely that fans already owned Wild World, which released three years prior and saw that City Folk was just an upscaled port. 
so a lot of fans saw no reason to purchase a game they pretty much already had but on the go. The second reason ties into my first reason, and I think this was simply the fact that more people had a DS than a Wii. While the Wii performed incredibly well, even more people owned a DS. So that could be one reason. The third reason why I think this game did not sell as well as it could have is that apparently it seems like the game was quite overhyped back in the day before its release. I think that the title City Folk or Let's Go to the City gave some fans the wrong idea of the game and had people falsely assume that we would be living in the city, when the reality was simply that the city was a new hub to find shops and characters at. A lot of these characters you could find in the city weren't even new, and the actual town of Animal Crossing wasn't anything new. This might have left some fans disappointed. Part 4. An actual review of City Folk, because apparently that's hard to do. Now that that's over with, I'm going to actually give a legitimate review of Animal Crossing City Folk and say what I love and don't love about the game, because Animal Crossing City Folk reviews are actually not common. If you do find anyone mentioning the game on YouTube, it's likely just used as a comparison to Wild World, or even labeled as a bad Animal Crossing game when a lot of people didn't even play this entry, or didn't even give it a revisit before making the video. So, like sit down and pretend that it's 2008. A new Animal Crossing game just released, and I'm going to review it. That isn't to say though that I won't compare it to later titles, because I probably will. To give a brief overview of the game, Animal Crossing City Folk is a lot like past entries. I mean, you know the Animal Crossing formula, if you don't, then why are you watching this video? <laughs> you move into a town full of animals, fish, bug catch, you can visit other people's towns, pay off your home loan, chat with villagers, you get the memo. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, this game introduced the city, the main selling point of the game. Cap'n's purpose in this game is to drive the bus that takes you to the city, and yeah, he's just as creepy in this game as he is in most games. If you can't tell, I'm not really a big fan of Cap'n. The city was a hub world where you could visit shops and places. While a lot of these were returning characters, these were usually traveling characters you had to wait throughout the week to visit, like Red or Katrina. Now these were characters you could visit whenever you wanted to. There was also the Marquis, a new addition to City Folk. Dr. Shrunk and sometimes a new character, Master Frillard, would give you reactions this way. Next to the Marquis was the Happy Room Academy, or the HRA. By going to the HRA, you could get your HRA score any day you wanted to. In the back room, it would also feature the highest ranking house as an example. This could be either your house, any villager's house, or even the other people who share the Wii with you. This feature is also exclusive to City Folk, never returning in any game. Next was my personal favorite feature in the city, Gracie Grace. While Gracie Grace and her items are no new addition to the series, this was the first time she had her own shop and you could visit and buy her clothes and furniture anytime you wanted to. Before, she was also just another traveling villager and you didn't get to choose what item you got from her. Her furniture and clothes are super expensive, but this gave a lot of players something to save their money for after they paid off their home loan. While not directly related to the city, another feature exclusive to City Folk that never returned in any other Animal Crossing game was the shopping card. After depositing 10,000 bells in your ABD account, the next day you would receive a shopping card in your mail. This allowed players to be able to directly buy items with their shopping card instead of using bells on hand. This really came in handy when you were at a store like Gracie Grace, where it would be inconvenient to bring hundreds of thousands of bell bags with you in your pockets. It's frustrating to see Timmy and Tommy from New Horizons say that their store doesn't offer a line of credit when this was literally a feature from 2008. Gracie Grace also introduced LaBelle for the first time in the series, the third Able sister, adding onto the lore and tragic backstory of the Able sisters even further. She was basically the sales clerk in this game and was exclusive to the city. There was also the auction house led by Lloyd. The auction house can unfortunately not be officially accessed anymore due to this being a We Connect 24 exclusive, and well, We Connect 24 ended in June of 2013, although there are other resources. <laughs> Before this service ended though, you could see your friend's items listed at the auction house and purchase their items, sort of like retail before retail. Next to the auction house was sometimes where Kick sat. Many fans forgot that City Folk actually introduced us to Kicks for the first time. While shoes weren't their own item yet in the game, they wouldn't be until New Leaf, you could technically change your shoe color. Kicks change the color of your shoes to either match your hair color or the style of clothes you were wearing. Next to that was Shampoodle. This was the first time in Animal Crossing history where changing your hair was easily accessible. Changing your hair was not an option at all in population growing, and you had to upgrade your nook's cranny to the last possible upgrade in Wild World to have access to Shampoodle, which you couldn't even upgrade until you had a friend visit your town. 
This proved to be difficult for those of us who didn't have any friends who played Animal Crossing, or those of us who played after Nintendo shut down Wi-Fi for the DS in 2014. So, having immediate access to Shampoodle is crazy to me. We didn't even have that in New Leaf, as Shampoodle wasn't unlockable. So, there's a win for City Folk in regard to customization. You could also have the ability to add a me mask to your face. While it was viewed as mostly silly, it was a cool addition. Like I mentioned before, Red and Katrina were also in the city, Red being where you can purchase art and furniture from, and Katrina being where you can have your fortune told. There was also the Reset Surveillance Center. On some nights, the tunnel to the Reset Surveillance Center was open, and you could visit Dawn and Sunny Rossetti for the very first time. Last but not least, it was Phineas making a debut appearance in this game. In this game on some days, he would give out free balloons, bubbles, and pinwheels, and it was all just super cute and fun. I think Phineas is one of the most underrated Animal Crossing characters. Although he's had very different roles in the only two games he's appeared in, every time you see Phineas, you know it's going to be a good time and he'll bring you a smile. He gave out free balloons in City Folk and gave out badges in New Leaf. I wish he would return in a future game. That was the city, but what about the rest of the game? Well, City Folk brought in some new special characters. Pave, Zipper T Bunny, Serena, and Nat were some new characters I hadn't previously mentioned before. Like I alluded to earlier, City Folk also brought specific holidays. So characters like Franklin, Jack, and Jingle made a returning appearance for the first time since 2001, and this was also the debut of Bunny Day and Festival as well. City Folk also saw the return of multiple tier towns, not to mention that the towns were larger too. You could also sort of choose where your house was located at. There are four possible houses players can move into upon starting the game, so you can at least have more control than pass entries, although not entire control of where you live, like in New Leaf or New Horizons. And speaking of houses, players now have their own house to themselves. The fully upgraded house includes the main floor, basement, and upstairs room. The game is also the last appearance of the attic, where players can save their game and change their settings. I think the last addition I enjoy about City Folk is the upgraded soundtrack. While sharing the same soundtrack as Wild World, City Folk has a high quality version of the soundtracks. The Wild World and City Folk soundtrack is probably my favorite in this series, but then again, I am biased since this was my first Animal Crossing game. The accordion in the soundtrack just brings me back so much nostalgia. I was an early bird as a kid, so 5am and 6am are probably the most nostalgic songs in the soundtrack for me. I love how 5am sounds so peaceful, meanwhile 6am is energetic and wakes you up. Some more favorites from the City Folk soundtrack I love are 12pm, 6pm, and 8pm. Also, the morning tracks in general are all pretty great and energetic. It may feel like I'm not going into huge detail about the specifics of the game, and the fact is, is that it is very similar to both Population Growing and Wild World. But you have to keep in mind that City Folk was my first Animal Crossing game, and I had nothing to compare the game to. I eventually did go and play Wild World and Population Growing, and didn't enjoy them as much because I saw City Folk as the definitive version of both games, the definitive classic Animal Crossing game, with better graphics and more features. So I think that's why it's difficult for me to grasp the City Folk hate, because even to this day, I do believe that City Folk is the definitive game from this era. I guess most people don't see the game that way. Part 5. Things I don't like about City Folk Just because I think City Folk is the definitive game from this era doesn't mean that I'm nostalgia blind and don't see its flaws. I only really have two major criticisms with the game and three more minor criticisms. I think the biggest flaw of the game that prevents a lot of people from revisiting the game is the fact that it's on the Wii, and so naturally there are forced motion controls. I think my biggest hot take of the century is that I'm not really a huge fan of the Wii at all. While I do see how influential the Wii was in making Nintendo a major competitor again, especially considering that with every new Nintendo console since the NES, sales had been increasingly dropping until the Wii. I am just not a fan of many games from this era, and I strongly dislike motion controls. I think the motion control aspect really hinders City Folk from what it can be. You control your character by either using the Wii Remote and point and click where you want to go, or you can use the Wii Nunchuck to move, which is my preferred method. Unfortunately, even with the Nunchuck, you still need to point and click with the Wii Remote to do most actions, like even pull up the menu that brings you to your pockets, your map, and pretty much everything else. Unfortunately, this game does not support any alternative controllers, so you're pretty much forced into motion controls. I will say though that this could be a lot worse. You could have to, god forbid, shake the Wii remote to catch bugs and fish, but luckily that's not the case. I think my other big problem with the game is grass deterioration. This was a mechanic introduced in City Folk because the Animal Crossing dev team thought it would be a great idea to implement this, 
Its purpose was to create a unique, personalized path for every town, since it was believed that players would take the same path usually every day to get to the shops and other important places in town. By taking the same path to the same areas every day, the grass would naturally decay, leaving a path. While this had good intentions, it was definitely not executed well at all. This feature just led to players' towns becoming desert wastelands because they would run all over the place, leaving no more grass in sight. This feature returned to New Leaf, but it wasn't as severe as it was in City Folk, sometimes even taking years to create a path. But you could easily destroy grass within months, sometimes even weeks in City Folk, without even trying to. Walking instead of running slowed down this process, but it didn't stop the grass from being destroyed. And besides, who wants to walk instead of run anyway? It's a video game, it's supposed to be fun. This game also introduced We Speak to the series. This was a device that allowed you to communicate over voice chat with other players. Wow, that sounds really cool, right? You may be wondering then why it isn't talked about more often, or why you may have not have heard of it. Well, with things like grass deterioration, the premise was good. Execution, not so much. Because of the way the Wii Speak was made, there was a feedback loop and you would hear your own voice being played back from you from the other end of the TV being played from the other player's TV. It already sounds abysmal playing with only two players, but now imagine playing with four players. Things got chaotic real quick and it was almost impossible to use. Another criticism I have with the game are the villagers. While New Horizons is known to have some of the weakest villager dialogue in the series, New Leaf is often considered the start of villager dialogue becoming so weak. I'm here to prove that incorrect. City Folk was the first Animal Crossing game to start having weaker dialogue, just no one actually played the game. I would say the dialogue in City Folk is miles more engaging than New Leaf and New Horizons dialogue, but you don't have to go sassy and mean remarks in this game like you did in past titles. The villagers still have semi-strong personalities, but I just thought I should note it here. It is a comprehensive video about Animal Crossing after all. I think my last minor criticism is that this is literally the third installment of the series, and you still have to jump through hoops just to change the color of your skin, and you can't choose the color of your skin from the start? Seriously? People make excuses for Animal Crossing all the time, bringing up excuses, such as the fact that Japan is mostly a homogeneous country, meaning that the majority of the population have pale skin, unlike somewhere more heterogeneous like in America where there are diverse skin colors. But come on, with this series all about customization, it's bizarre to me that you couldn't change the color of your skin without tanning for hours in a mainline Animal Crossing game until 2020? Also, even if you are going to use the whole dark skinned people aren't as common in Japan BS excuse I hear all the time, then what is the localization team for? By 2013, Pokemon already had this feature, albeit very primitive and not diverse at all, but it at least implemented the feature. There's no excuse in my opinion for Animal Crossing to take so long to implement a feature like that. Those are really my only main criticisms with Animal Crossing City Folk. Some are kind of minor and some don't really hinder the game at all, but I do have quite a few issues with the first two reasons I listed. Overall, however, I think every Animal Crossing game will have its flaws, and I think City Folk has less noticeable flaws than population growing, and especially Wild World. Conclusion after diving deep into Animal Crossing City Folk, I do understand a little more why it is not as loved as, like, say, Wild World. However, I think it deserves so much more love than it gets, being the superior version of population growing and Wild World. I think poor timing and placement really limited this game. If it was the first Animal Crossing game to be released, then I think it would be endlessly praised. But if it wasn't your first Animal Crossing game, you likely saw it as a lazy port. Like I said before, this was my introduction to the series, and I saw a few problems with it, really. My hopes for the future is that more people will become eager to go back and revisit City Folk, or hell, even check it out for the first time. It technically is the least played mainline game. I think a lot of people will be surprised at how well this game holds up to this day. If you have or have not played City Folk, I strongly recommend this game, as I believe that it is the best Animal Crossing game from this particular classic era, that being a pre-New Leaf era. Although not my favorite in the series, that has to go to New Leaf, this will always be the Animal Crossing game that I have the most nostalgia for, and I'm so glad I was introduced to the series back in 2012 just in time to experience the launch of Animal Crossing New Leaf only half a year later. Thank you Animal Crossing City Folk, I hope that you get the love you deserve one day.